This is the Oculus Quest 2, and it's really, really cool. Facebook has sold more than 10 million of these since launch, making it the company's most successful headset. But what makes it so good? And what can you actually do with it? Well, I bought one just to find out. This is the 128 gigabyte version. And after playing around with it for a few weeks, I finally understand. You see, the Quest 2 has improved upon the Quest 1, both in terms of the display and the processing power. But it's not just the hardware specs that's interesting. Since launch, the Quest 2 has also added in 120 Hz support, as well as AirLink, which is a wireless technology. But what really sets the Quest 2 apart is that it's able to run standalone. You see, typically VR headsets require some kind of connection to the PC for data and a base station to track the joysticks. The Quest 2 does away with all that and instead has a built-in processor for data and a bunch of internal sensors to do the tracking. This reduces setup time and greatly improves ease of use. What's more, at $300, it's the cheapest out of all the current offerings. But that low price is probably because Facebook is profiting off your data. Although you don't need to connect your Facebook account anymore, you still have to make an Oculus account and connect your phone, which is to say you're still giving Facebook your data. But privacy issues aside, the Quest 2 is still an impressive piece of kit. Inside the box, you get everything seen here. Taking a closer look at the headset, it's made out of plastic and has a fabric strap. There's an audio jack and USB-C on the left, and the volume and power buttons are on the right. There's also two speakers, one on each side. They sound pretty good, but are a bit lacking in bass. There's three settings for the inner pupil distance, ranging from 58 millimeters to 68. My eyes are 70 millimeters apart, which is a bit wider than the widest option, but it still works fine for me. The main downside to this design is that if you want to share this headset with anyone, you have to readjust it for them and then readjust it back so it fits your head. And if you have glasses, it's gonna suck even with the glasses spacers. But there's a workaround. You can 3D print lens inserts and order some prescription lenses online. The foam for the Quest 2 is known to cause skin irritation, so it's recommended to use the silicone cover. As for the joysticks, they come with a built-in lanyard and use a removable AA battery. When I first looked at these joysticks, I was wondering what the circles are for. And it turns out they're to protect your hands. I've hit these things against my desk several times already, and they hold up pretty well. The controllers use a proprietary wireless connection, so you can't connect your computer to it. The cable measures in at 40 inches, or a little over a meter. This isn't quite long enough for USB tethering, but it's definitely long enough for regular charging. As for setup, the manual really doesn't say much, but there are a bunch of online guides. Virtual Reality Oasis has done a pretty good job of that, so I'll leave a link to his video down in the description below. As for battery life, I'm able to get about two hours per charge, and charge time is also about two hours. All right, that's enough specs. Let's see what this thing can actually do. Let's start with Beat Saber. If you're wondering, this game is like Rock Band, except with lightsabers. The goal is to slash through the boxes as they come toward you. I've played this for an hour straight, and it was very comfortable. One thing I did notice about this game is that I get drop frame rates when using Bluetooth headphones. And after looking around, it turns out the Quest 2 doesn't support Bluetooth very well. VR also brings a whole new level of immersion for first-person shooters. In Pavlov, reloading is really cool. It's a whole sequence of actions and coordination, but the game does cause motion sickness. Here, when I walk around, my eyes are saying that I'm moving, but my ears and body are saying I'm stationary. And it's these conflicting signals that make my brain all confused. I was able to last about five minutes before having to put the headset down. Some games, like Rec Room, try to remedy this issue by adding a binocular effect. When moving, it helps a bit, but I still experience some motion sickness. Another alternative is to completely remove the motion altogether, like in Half-Life Alex. Here, movement is done by teleporting, and personally, I like this implementation the best. But it doesn't quite feel natural. Ideally, the best solution would be to somehow trick my ears and body into thinking that I'm moving. But until that happens, movement is always going to be an issue. Besides VR games, there's also 2D games that can be streamed from the desktop PC. Here, I'm using an app called Virtual Desktop because I found it to be the best for playing wirelessly. 
moving the cards around feels responsive, but when I shake the cards around, it doesn't feel very smooth. I have all the settings at 120Hz, so it might have to do with the transmit rate of the controllers. Either way, it's definitely a worthwhile experience. I tried out a few other games, and it was pretty much the same big screen experience. The only main complaint I have is that the colors on the Quest 2 are very flat. That is to say, it doesn't look as vibrant as my monitors. I guess this is where Facebook decided to cut corners to keep the costs low. To some people, this might not matter, but for scenic games like Horizon 5, then it takes away from the experience. One of the most underrated applications is videos. In the YouTube VR app, there's dedicated channels for 360 degree content like AirPano VR. You get to fly over waterfalls, mountains, and all sorts of scenic areas. And words really can't describe how impressive this is. Maybe the biggest downside is that YouTube only streams up to 4K and the colors look a bit washed out. Now 8K 120Hz VR content does exist but they're mostly found on novelty sites. There's also an option for regular 2D content, and just like gaming, it feels like you're watching it on a really big screen. This could be extremely useful if you live in a crowded dorm and just don't have the space to mount a projector. But one of the use cases that's really caught my eye is productivity. The dream would be to get rid of my desk setup and work anywhere in my house. Oculus announced AirLink, which is a program that mirrors a PC wirelessly. Unfortunately, AirLink does require a pretty powerful system and good internet connections. The other issue is that the resolution is just too low to do actual work. Small texts don't get rendered well, and there's not much you can do about that. The interface is also clunky, and here's me trying to do a quick search. Facebook has also launched another program called Horizon Workrooms. This is basically an office environment simulator. Here, I only get a single monitor, but it can still remote into my PC. And instead of a virtual keyboard, I have to use a combination of hand gestures and a Bluetooth keyboard. It's a neat idea, but the sensors don't pick up on hand gestures very well. Unfortunately, it's still in beta, so there's still a lot of missing features. But it shows promise, and I hope to test it out in the future. Now, one thing that doesn't get mentioned much is the hidden cost of owning this device. Games like Beat Saber typically cost 35 Canadian or $30 USD, and you don't even get all the songs. For those, you have to purchase them extra. You can also get hardware upgrades for the Quest 2, like a more comfortable Elite strap. If you want to connect to Steam VR, then you'll either need a long USB cable or use virtual desktop for wireless connections. And of course, there's custom lenses if you wear glasses. My point is, to get the most out of the headset, you have to buy into the ecosystem. All right, that was a lot of information, so let's summarize. The Quest 2 starts at 300 USD, making a great entry point to try out VR. The unit can run standalone, so there's no tethering or base stations involved. There's consistent updates, and it's already received a bunch of new features since launch. VR brings a whole new level of immersion to games and video, but it's a double-edged sword and can cause motion sickness. As for the negatives, the Quest 2 does require a phone and an online account for setup, which can cause privacy concerns. There's only three settings for the inner pupil distance, so it won't fit properly if you're way outside of that range. Compared to 2D, there's very limited content for VR games and videos. Productivity is still in the rough and will have to wait a few years of development before it matures. Finally, there's a bunch of hidden costs which can quickly add up. Overall, the Quest 2 is an amazing device. Even if you don't play any games, getting to experience the latest VR technology is worth the $300 price tag. I personally like using mine to play Beat Saber and watch nature documentaries. All right, that's it. Like and subscribe.